the closer you are to the work, the bigger the ideas can become. Business of Architecture, episode 418. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I have the great pleasure of speaking with Philip Kafka and Ishtiak Rafudin. So Philip is the president of Prince Concepts, which is a development company based in Detroit. Before setting up Prince Concepts, uh, Philip had spent six years building Prince Media Company, which was a billboard business in New York City and he tells us a fantastic story about how he set up that company was going around scouting out locations uh, for that were ideally suited for billboards and how that became an incredibly successful business which he ended up selling the with the proceeds from that sale that was the beginning of the capital for the investment uh, for the Prince Concepts development company. Ishtiak Rafudin is a designer and architect. He started Undecorated in 2017. Prior to Undecorated, Ish co-founded a co-working space called Based In. He also co-founded a visualization studio, which was based out of Istanbul and Beirut. They provided services for architects and developers, working with the likes of Sana, Herzog de Muren, and Benchmark. Between 2006 and 2004, Ish trained as a designer at Rex and OMA and worked on a large amount of different project typologies. And I think what's really interesting in this conversation is Philip and Ish talk about their collaboration, how they've been working together, how they've been putting ideas and architecture at the forefront of the developments. Philip discusses some of his ground up development projects such as True North. He discusses his philosophy and his investment strategy and how and why Detroit has been the home for both of them now for the last few years. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Philip Kafka and Ishtiak Rafudin. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Philip and Ish, welcome to the business of architecture. Absolute pleasure to be speaking with you. How are you both? Doing very well. Thank you. It's a beautiful day. Excellent. Now, you you guys really amazing portfolio of work. Philip, you're kind of the, the leader of Prince Concepts, a really innovative development company based in uh, Detroit. And Ish, you are the principal of Undecorated, an architectural design firm. Uh, and you guys have been collaborating with each other on some uh, quite fascinating projects. And I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the development work that Philip's been involved in are sort of architectural wonders and very appealing on the kind of, a kind of community-led um, values as well that a lot of architects are very, uh, you know, very passionate about, particularly in today's climate. Um, so I guess the first question to ask both of you is how did your businesses independently start and how did the collaboration begin? Go ahead, Ish. Okay, so, okay, so I'll, I guess I'll go first. Um, I think for, for me, um, I started the office in New York City, um, and I started actually with uh, the office loosely with a friend. We were doing freelance work, um, and I think the idea of having an office or doing work independently just came came after, you know, a number of years working for you know a larger office, which is kind of typical for architects. And so, after working for a larger office and ha having completed you know a number of projects. Um, this was about eight years into, you know, uh, uh, leaving architecture school. I felt like, you know, like intuitively, I felt that I had learned enough and I needed to kind of move on because I was, I was, I reached a point where maybe the work was getting repetitive. And, and I think also that I had a very unique experience 
with that work. Um, I spent two years on a job site uh, working for an office and I learned a lot and I just felt intuitively that I needed to, you know, kind of graduated the, that phase of my life in terms of career and I needed to do something independently. And then I, and I asked myself a series of questions and ultimately the questions were if there, is there an office in, you know, that I would want to work for that's reasonable, you know, and I even thought about it internationally. And I, and I came to the conclusion that there wasn't because there were, you know, and, and at that point I, I decided that I had to start my own practice because like in my mind, there were like a handful of offices that I would have worked for globally. And I reached the conclusion that I'll, those offices, the work that was being done there was redundant with my work mm-hmm. um, or with the office that I previously worked for. Um, and then I came to the conclusion that I, if I went to the, you know, these other offices, then it would be, the work would be similar. So, so that was, it was kind of like a process of elimination for me. Yeah. And, and then I started off doing renderings like freelance work renderings. Um, and then with my friend Tomas, we, we, the first project we did together was a project in Mexico city. Um, and Philip was our basically second client, uh, you know, uh, maybe six months into having started that office or right. practice because we were doing renderings and architecture and we didn't really have a kind of def- defined scope of work. So it was, it was really early on in the, in the kind of genesis of the company that you started the collaboration with Philip. Yes, Philip and I were friends maybe for a couple of years right. at that point, maybe three years or something. Um, and uh, we saw each other um, socially. So, um, yeah, so, so it was, it, you know, it was, it was working together was more like being friendly. It wasn't so serious, you know, and I think now the work has t- taken a much more uh, professional um, and, you know, um, it's, it's taken on a whole, a whole new kind of life in, you know, in, in and of itself for us, for me and for Philip, you know, so I, I'm speaking for Philip in this case, but yeah, it was very early on. Yeah. Right. And Philip, your career trajectory is quite different. You want to tell us about how your 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 previous incarnation, and then as well. Yeah. So I I um I studied uh, philosophy in university, not really knowing exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I also played tennis in college and spent almost a year playing uh, pro tennis, traveling around the world, just mostly just traveling, but using tennis as a vehicle to travel. Um, and then I ended up in New York City interviewing for jobs. And one of the jobs that I interviewed for was a billboard company. And they offered me $10 an hour to go around the city scouting sign, lo- sign locations for them. And I had a background in the business. My father had been in that business in Texas. And so I started to do some research on my own. I, I didn't feel like there was a rush to take a $10 an hour job off the bat. And so I started doing some research on my own. I started pulling zoning maps of New York City. I was 23 years old at the time. And I started running around the city with a zoning map, taking addresses of buildings that were zoned right for advertising signs and that had a location where I could develop a sign. And um, it worked. I, I never took a job. I did my first deal with a New Yorker. Um, when I called him, he said, yeah, yeah, you sign guys have been bugging the heck out of me. What's going on? And um, I knew right there my analysis of whether this was a, a legal location because you have to get a permit just like anything in building. My analysis was correct if all the other companies have been calling him. So I said, I'll be over to your office in 10 minutes. And we did a handshake deal and that was my first location. And so I had that business for six years. I built it uh, to the second largest uh, sign company in New York City. And then I sold the company. Um, But after having the business for three years, I started to become, you know, profitable and successful. And uh, well, successful is what what did uh, Churchill say? Success is never final. Um, failure is never fatal. So I was successful for the moment and I wanted to find a place where I could take some of my profits and invest in real estate and maybe do something in New York. I was developing what I had access to, which were walls, you know, a young guy, I can't get into real estate in New York. I've could have, I could have worked in for a big firm or I could have, you know, worked for a big company and I would have just been a piece of a much bigger puzzle. Um, and so I started to travel to many cities mostly Rust Belt cities, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, St. Louis, Cleveland, um, 
visiting these places, trying to understand them. And Detroit was one of the cities I went to. And I was just kind of blown away by what I found. I'd never, you know, we, we, we see lower income areas, we see wealthy areas, but in America, and actually in most parts of the world, it's rare that you see abandonment on the scale that you see in Detroit. Maybe there are some small one trick pony towns that had one economy that, that disappeared yeah. and then you have abandonment, but I'd never seen abandonment in the scale that I'd seen in Detroit, a city built for 2 million that only had 700,000. And I started to take all my weekends off in New York. And once a month I'd drive, I'd fly to Detroit and I'd spend the entire weekend just driving around just like my sign business, taking addresses of buildings that I liked, of intersections that I liked, coming back to New York, calling the owners of the buildings. And finally, I, I bought my first building, uh, which was this little garage, um, which had three walls and no roof when I bought it, a little corner property. And then that's the first project that Ish and I had done together. I, I wanted to do a restaurant there. Um, I met a chef who had an amazing food truck and uh, he and his business partner had a great food truck. I had the building um, and, you know, Ish kind of heard that I bought the building and heard I was going to do a restaurant and tugged at my sleeve and said, Hey, Philip, let me design your restaurant. And, um, he gave me a fee proposal and, you know, it was reasonable. And <laughs> I said, well, we can at least try the experiment. And then deciding to work with Ish was like, you know, it opened my mind to the world of ideas and architecture and architecture as, you know, a world of ideas, as opposed to, um, a service that's provided hmm. you know amazing um with some of the early projects then what were some of the kind of values that you were both establishing as a as a collaboration because obviously the work is uh you know it's not like what your regular developers would be doing there's 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 like a social agenda there there's an like you say there was a there's a creative agenda there the, the the projects are very distinct very unique well i can what i can say is and this is this is how i ended up like really investing in architecture and i didn't know this at the time but basically my philosophy and what detroit's allowed me to do is my idea is i buy real estate most people buy the, the traditional the traditional saying in real estate is you buy location 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 that's what matters mm -hmm. and i don't believe in that as a real developer, you want to buy location, but not for, not for an audience, not for traffic counts, not for accessibility. You buy location because of some sort of magic that you might be able to create. But then if you don't buy that audience, you get real estate for a much lesser price than it's really worth. And that isn't money that you save on your bottom line. That's money that you can in, then invest into experimentation, into ideas, into architecture, and into landscape. So... I didn't, I, was, I didn't know that at the time when I first started working with Ish, but why would I rather buy a building for $30,000 way off the beaten path with no roof and three walls than a building for that same building for $600,000, you know, five minutes closer to downtown where there's action because I just bought myself $570,000 to invest into a real project, into an idea, as opposed to just buying a location. Yeah. So that was my philosophy. Amazing. And Isha, how, yeah. how, yeah, how was your, how was your philosophy and influence? <laughs> so I, so I think, um, you know, like it's it, interestingly, I think a lot of, a lot of my ideas and philosophy has like manifested through the work that we, you know, are doing for Philip. So, and I think, you know, the work is growing. Um, and I think it's interesting because also, you know, I came from an office where we were doing, you know, um, like more uh, high level architecture, let's say, or architecture for you know, institutional architecture. Um, so where we were doing museums and, um, and civic projects, as well as um, you, were, you were at OMA before was that? I was at OMA and I was at uh, for a short time where we worked on Miami Beach Convention Center, I was there for one project. Um, and I was at Rex, okay. uh, which which is you know um, uh, Rex, the partners or the uh, principal at Rex. Yep. Used to work at OMA, um, and uh, so the and so and I worked on you know uh, a project in Turkey where which was the headquarters for a fashion company. So it was 
it was very, you know, very much celebrated in, in the, you know, center of, you know, social and cultural kind of stratosphere. So the idea of working in Detroit was, in fact, you know, because of the reasons that Philip said, it was, it was quite the opposite. And I, you know, I always found that interesting. Um, I studied in Buffalo, uh, which is a similar city in, uh, in New York, a post-industrial city that um, has uh, had a similar kind of fate as Detroit. Um, so I think that it was, it was, the idea was interesting. And I think for me, the, the architecturally, what I believe in is, you know, um, one, this idea of resourcefulness. And I learned this uh, through my work in Turkey when I, when I went there for, for construction administration for Rex, um, I had to work with, you know, local contractors who didn't always have the same kind of technological kind of capabilities as contractors in America. So we had to figure out details. So it was basically my job was like to make it work. <laughs> so, and then with whatever means possible with our local contractors and as well as a local architect. So in, and I did that for two years and, and I learned how to take design, something that you would design, you know, or in New York in this case, and then adapt it to, you know, trades in, in Turkey. And I, that was a very valuable skill that I still practice today because that's something we do here in the sense that like we have ideas and they're at a high level, but then we need to execute it at a kind of cost-effective and reasonable way. So my goal coming into the project was, I think I basically promised Philip that I would give him, you know, we would deliver design, but it wouldn't, it would be within a reasonable budget and it would be, um, it would offer something uh, that's iconic, that's a destination and um, and also, you know, refreshing. And um, so I think that's on one level, that was, there, there was that kind of promise, but there was also the promise that we would rethink everything. Mm -hmm. So, and in order to deliver something interesting, you know, and I come, came from, you know, this OMA culture where you take, um, you take a project and you have to kind of rethink what it means, rethink how you can do it. So this idea of reframing and rethinking paired with the context of Detroit was so sensible because you had to rethink how to do, in this case, a restaurant because, because it's not your typical place. You need to, um, people are not just walking outside and they're you know going to stumble, stumble in. So we had a great chef um, and that was, a great start you know but we needed to kind of meet that with great architecture so mm -hmm. so in the in the process of reframing we're able to offer something very refreshing and very different than your typical restaurant experience you know and and in many ways also challenging us and challenging the public with with you know um with a different way to experience you know in this case the consumption of food so when for example this first project was the idea, Philip, then to buy and own a restaurant or how did the business model emerge for the, for the site and for the brief? And Yes, it's a good question. I, I'd never had a background in the restaurant industry, but what I realized was my bigger objective in Detroit wasn't to buy this one building and have a restaurant. Right. My bigger objective was there was all this ab abandoned city, vacant city, beautiful parts of city, space, all space, which is so rare in an urban context. You never have the combination of just space with infrastructure. You, ha you have space without infrastructure and you have infrastructure with no space, but you never have space and infrastructure together. So the idea was I wanted to buy a large area, which is what I ended up doing. This first project was about five minutes from there. It was totally abandoned, an area that nobody wanted to buy real estate and nobody saw value in. And I wanted to bring people there. I really literally wanted to be a developer. I wanted to bring people where they otherwise wouldn't have gone. Now, if you do it with housing, you build 10 units and you service 10 people and maybe the guests that they have over. So maybe you bring 30 new people to a neighborhood a month, mm -hmm. really. But if you do it with a restaurant and it's a successful restaurant, you're bringing 5,000 new people to a place every month. And you know, so the thing about it is people talk about, oh, a neighborhood starts with a coffee shop. Well, you have to understand the psychology of that. 
it's a very low investment for a person to go somewhere new to spend $3 and five minutes to buy a cup of coffee. You could go to the most exotic, um, you know, neighborhood that you've never been to that seems totally far out and be like, okay, it's just five minutes and it's just $3. I'm going to run in there and get my coffee and see how it feels. So then dinner is the next one. Dinner is a little bit more of a commitment. It's two hours and $50, you know, for yourself. So you say, okay, wow. So maybe a cafe gets me 10,000 people, a restaurant gets me 5,000 people. And then once people get comfortable sitting there for two hours, you know, going to dinner there a couple of times a month, then you can get them to say, well, I could actually see myself living here. Mm. And so restaurants were how I was going to cultivate an audience because remember I, as a developer, didn't want to buy the audience by buying location. I needed to cultivate an audience for myself. Mm -hmm. And that put the pressure on me to, you know, everybody in development, they talk about the macroeconomics of a city. What about jobs and what about, you know, the economy for me, I try to keep my project small enough so that it's my own work that cultivates my audience. Hopefully I have 50 people living in my apartments that really care about architecture and care about landscape and care about community. And so if the job market swings one direction or the other, hopefully it doesn't affect them as much. They're there for specifically what we build and specifically the lifestyle that we provide. But restaurants were how I was going to cultivate that audience first and foremost. Brilliant. Really thoughtful strategy. Very, very, very interesting. Um, so what was the first, what was the project that came after the restaurant and how successful was, was that? How did it start to evolve? Well, you know, so we built the restaurant and the re restaurant was, the restaurant was not in the area where I'm developing now. It was a little bit off the beaten path mm -hmm. from an area that was a little bit relevant. It was kind of a hybrid. It was in between my deep in the middle of nowhere strategy and deep in the middle of somewhere strategy it was kind of in between. And the restaurant was an absolute sensation ish nailed it. A story like, you know, there was so much stuff to do on this little building with three walls and no roof. And like the first idea that Ish suggested is we need to move the door. I was like, the door is the one thing that's resolved. I actually have it. <laughs> like, why are you adding more to my to-do list? You know, but there was always a reason behind Ish's ideas. And so we moved the door we built the restaurant. The restaurant was an absolute sensation. We were a James Beard uh, finalist of some sort. Some of those awards, we were open for 11 months. The chef is super talented, very creative. Mm -hmm. Ish's architecture was definitely amused to him and inspired the food and the audience. Two hour wait every night. And then after being open for 11 months, somebody broke in after we won all these awards and burned the place down. Yikes. And I know. And when this was happening, um, and so just to comment on Ish, and this is one of the things that solidified our working and working relationship and friendship, Ish got on a plane basically then, helped me come, helped me rebuild the restaurant, you know, redesigned it essentially, made some changes and some enhancements, toughened it up. And basically he's been in Detroit ever since. <laughs> I, I say that a, a, good, a, good architect, a good architect gets you into trouble because with new ideas, you, you go into territory that you necessarily don't know how to deal with a great architect comes and helps you get out of trouble. And so <laughs> Ish has gotten me into trouble and he's gotten me out of trouble. <laughs> but, but I went and I, I, Ish was busy with another project in New York. Mm -hmm. And I, I, in this area that was a little bit off the beaten path, I had my audience with the restaurant. I saw that I could bring them somewhere else. Um, I built a housing project called true North. Uh, I worked with an architect named Edwin Chan in LA and um, he we designed a great project with, I, I tasked him with using the Quonset hut to create a, a living community. And that's what act, has activated that neighborhood. And, and then Ish wrapped up his project in New York. And then Ish and I have continued to work together in this true, neighborhood true, since. True North is the one with the kind of corrugated. It's it the still? first project I've done. Yes, exactly. It's the first project with corrugated metal huts. And the idea was that I wanted to use these structures because I wanted to give people access to space. Yeah. Whereas most developers are thinking about density. Again, when I underpay for land, the onus isn't on me to overdevelop it. I don't have to max out my leasable square footage. Mm. And, but at the same time, I, I was pioneering. I needed to be sensible in, in the costs. So the Quonset hut gave me access to high quality space for lower price. And then I tasked, you know, Ish has also done a project with a Quonset hut, the Caterpillar. So I've been tasking architects who are super talented 
to create museum quality living space for a reasonable price for people to live in architecture. So, so it's, it's quite a big risk that would, I would sure like put off a lot of other developers, you know, um, taking a, a, a kind of no man's land type part of the city and being confident enough that you're able, you're going to be able to attract and grow an audience there, particularly something like with a restaurant, because it wasn't just developing a fantastic space. Like you've got, you had to develop a great restaurant as well. And all the mechanics of the restaurant, how did you make sure that that team was in place as well? Did, did you, did you know them as well previously or? We, we all have, I took a lot of risk. I did. And we all have our deficiencies and we all have our strengths. Mm -hmm. The strengths of the people that I've worked with so far were right were what I needed when I needed them. I no longer own restaurants. I'm just a landlord to restaurants now. Um, I pivoted everything. I just, I own the restaurant and everything in it. And I've just basically leased everything that I built two chefs now yeah we it built three restaurants together um and it is a big risk but to me i was young i was 29 when i started in detroit and i'm 35 now um i, I 20 started developing in detroit it was a bigger picture because i'd rather know what i'm capable of you know it's kind of like you know if you get in the boxing ring it's like, oh my gosh, aren't you afraid of getting punched? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, but if I do get punched and then I'm fine on the other side of it, or even if I don't get punched and I dodge and bob and weave, I know what I'm capable of. So you get in and you take the risk. And as a young man, I had the resilience to say, well, if this doesn't go well, I still have a whole life ahead of me to figure, to use these lessons. And by the way, we've made so many mistakes on all of our projects. And the thing about it is, is that, that's what motivates the next phase of work. Every mistake I make on one project is a down payment on the next. Mm. And then the next project basically addresses all the mistakes I previously made. And, and so I've made a lot of mistakes and I probably could have been more successful if I'd known more when I started, but if I'd known more, I probably wouldn't have done all this anyway. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, have, what have been some of those mistakes that um, both of you have, have realized and navigated together as you're as you're kind of moving along this relationship because that's also a really interesting aspect of this is that this has now become you know like a mature architect developer relationship you guys have executed and fulfilled on a number of different projects and that that kind of acquired knowledge or institutional knowledge if you like between the both of you is 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 an incredible asset and very valuable what were some of the the mistakes that you were making on the development side or perhaps the design side that have now evolved and become powerful assets in themselves. What do you think, Ish? Um, I think there's a lot, there's a lot to learn from uh, just construction, making mistakes in construction um, and a lot to learn from perhaps choosing the wrong material or the wrong process to, to execute something. Um, so, so I think, you know, I don't know. So I think we, you know, like for Tukoy, we went through like three contractors <laughs> when we did the restaurant. So, so that was one, you know, like, you know, it's, it's just knowing, having the experience to know when someone's going to be able to execute something well or not. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's one thing, but also I think that, you know, often we're choosing maybe the, I won't say the wrong materials, but we, we, you know, choosing materials and choosing, um, like, like some materials are easy to work with. So you, they, so you can choose them to be worked on the job site. And that's something important, like plywood, for example. And so, so you can work with plywood on the job site versus, you know, choosing uh, another material, which has to be worked on in a factory. And that's a relatively, it's a, it's a silly, but <laughs> kind of important factor to, you know, to thinking about how to, how to choose materials and, is it going to be built on site? Is it going to be built on a factory? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, choosing between, you know, like, you know, like the labor aspect, like, is there more labor to something or is there more sophistication to something, you know? So, and I think those, those things are not, and so we try to bake that in. So what I call it is like preemptive value engineering. We bake all that in, in the design process so that we are prepared 
when it's going to be constructed, we're better prepared to know how it's going to happen and also project costs. This, you know, Ish's, Ish and I together have started to work this way. What I would say is to add to what Ish has just said is that there's existing conditions with every project. Existing conditions are sometimes evident. If you're doing an adaptive reuse project, it's the building that's there. But existing conditions are also not necessarily always tangible. They're not right in front of you. Even on a new construction project, existing conditions are which trades do you have that are talented? Which materials do you have that are accessible to you? Which, you know, who do you know that can execute the job well? If we have a concrete guy that's really good, we use concrete. If we have a block guy that can lay block well, we use block. And the people that we have around us are also existing conditions. And we've started to design projects, not only as ideas that we're trying to bring to life, but there's so much more satisfaction and gratification in bringing an idea to life that deals with existing conditions beautifully and elegantly mm -hmm. and intelligently. And the project that is just finished, we literally just finished it. The tenant just moved in June 1st is the project that I'm most proud of. And it was an idea that came right from Ish. And, and it's so valuable that Ish is in Detroit because I'm sure Ish had spent so much time around this building and he finally, you know, this idea struck him in a way. Um, but we used an old building, we used its structure. We, we built a second story on top of a one-story building. We took an alley and we occupied the alley and put a glass facade on each side of it. And we used everything that this old building gave us and we got exactly what we needed out of it. And it's not the most, most people don't even know the project's completed or it was even done. They show up to the park and it just, it's built on a park that we'd done as well, together as well. Mm -hmm. They show up and they just kind of, you know, take it as it is. It doesn't, it's not like a new construction product. It's there. It doesn't have that presence, but it's so small art because it used so many assets that we were given previously and that's what's so gratifying to me is how do we work with all of the existing conditions in terms of our market, also with landscape, using trees that we have that we can get accessibly. Our, the last residential product that Ish is sitting in right now, it's his live workspace mm -hmm. and a project that we finished. It's eight units of rent, eight rentable units with 200 trees. We were only able to do that because we went to all the tree farms in Michigan and we bought all of their excess inventory for a low price. And our landscape architect worked with, and that, that was now an existing condition. We had our own tree farm with all these trees for a good price. And our landscape architect, who's super talented, Julie Bargman, I'm actually here in Virginia right now, workshopping with her. She worked with those existing conditions and we got a phenomenal landscape and nobody would know, you, you, you know? Amazing. So that's the greatest lesson to me. And I'm, and I'm so happy. Ish has been so... It's just been a, a leader and a follower in that strategy. Mm. Totally willing to work within those restrictions, but also finding immense creativity and opportunities within them as well. Yeah. In, in terms of the, the kind of financial model for your development, is this something that basically from the sale of your previous business, you're, you're using 100% your own equity or do you have to, are you still using other people's money or investors or have any outside influence or outside, I, outside I, lenders that, that kind of help facilitate projects? All this risk taking was taken with my own capital yeah. from my business. Yeah. Um, that, that well is mostly dried up because development is extremely cost intensive. Sure. So I've, I've refinanced some properties yep. um, and I've taken money out of products that are completed and cash flowing. Mm -hmm. And now as I'm looking to do more projects, banks are very interested uh, and investors are very interested in the neighborhood because it's been working. You know, every space that we've developed has been leased mm -hmm. um, at, for the rates that we needed. And we're only getting better at construction. We're only getting better at the ideas that we build. So there's a lot of optimism from my office and that radiates out to other people that want to be part of it. But it's, it's very hard to take them on because there's so much time and money that's been invested into this. I say intelligence, not like intelligence in the traditional sense, but just this is very trade specific intelligence. Mm -hmm. Not to mention we planted over 500 trees in this immediate area. 
there's so much value that we've created. It's, it's hard for an investor to walk in. They want a run of the mill investment. And it's like, it, it's very hard for me to quantify my value you know yeah well that that but that becomes really interesting because obviously you've had this an incredible degree of freedom um using your own your own capital to, to kind of drive the projects the way that you want to do them and take and take the risk now you've got a load of projects which have all been executed and demonstrably they work they work in business principles they work um you know as as in as investments um but always as soon as you start bringing in other investors they're going to be looking you know you've got to be really selective, I guess. You've got to be really, really yeah. selective of having the right kind of person on board with you. And it's not just about the money, I would presume. It's, it's about what, what other kind of intelligence can they bring to the relationship? Correct. Well, what I've noticed is that, you know, on certain projects, there are the things that are non-negotiable. There's the idea. And those are the things that really, really, really matter. Mm -hmm. And and very uh, unfortunately, very few people who invest in real estate really understand that they still think it's about location. How many units, how inexpensively can you build them? And, and, and is there demand for that location? And we're doing it in a totally different way, which is what is the idea? And we're hoping that our ideas are exciting enough and we continue to go in this realm just because our neighborhood now has demand and it's beautiful. Doesn't mean that we're going to start producing cookie cutter apartments on a mass scale. You know, we're still going to try to innovate and some of the projects that Ish has designed that we're going to be breaking ground on later this summer, residential projects, they're still very innovative projects. And we're going to continue to do that because that's what keeps it interesting. So a lot of times investors want us to, they want us to repeat what we've already done. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, why don't you just do that again? You know, and, you know, I guess I think like an architect in this way, in the same way Ish was talking about his genesis away from other offices to his own office. It's like, I don't, I don't want to just continue to do the same thing over and over again. It'll diminish the brand in the neighborhood. It'll diminish the vitality of my brain. And it won't be something that at the end of the day, I'll be as proud of. Mm. Yep. You know? Ish, from your, from your perspective, um, are you involved in any of kind of developments yourself? Or do you get involved in any of the kind of either being an investor or a financial partner in any kind of way? And has it been some, if, if not, is it something that's on the horizon? Um, <laughs> or, or is the traditional I think, no. architectural services? So, no, I, so it's, yeah, my, my relationship with Philip and, and uh, my other clients is quite traditional. I have, you know, the idea of, you know, uh, equity, sorry, getting equity out of services mm -hmm. has come up, you know, uh, in certain cases, but, but, you know, we, I haven't, I haven't really worked on that. Um, but I think, you know, in the end, I also asked myself, I just, you know, like it's, it's basically this idea that I think I'm getting better at what I do, which is design. And then, and I feel like, and I've asked myself this question, but I just feel like I just want to get better at that part, the mm -hmm. architecture part. Um, and because I think, you know, I don't know, I just think that different, different people have different personalities and kind of energies and motivations for what they do. And for me, it's just the, for me, it's definitely architecture. I just, you know, and I, and I think that, yeah, so even though the, it's, the thought occurs, but I, I'm always like, I just want to get better at what I do rather than spread my, you know, resources to mm. other areas where I have to learn um, new skills or um, new ways of thinking, you sure. know, so I rather get deeper into the, the architecture process. So that's how I think, you know, and, you know, but I think there is, you know, the idea of passively investing and things like that, I think, you know, I think about, but it hasn't occurred yet. So, yeah. And it's been, you know, I moved to Detroit maybe four years ago, three, four years ago. So I am at the moment uh, trying to like one of the projects that Philip and I designed together um, will be a house hopefully you know um that we that i move into and invest in so i think that's interesting and i do live in one of the projects i designed uh which is caterpillar which is where i am now so that's also fun and, and kind of like also part of the kind of like the lived experience yeah. and a kind of a learning experience too has has the your portfolio now opened up you know a, a kind of a 
a pipeline, if you like, of other similar like-minded developers? Or is Philip still quite a unique character in that sense? <laughs> I think, you know, the, the Philip is extremely unique and still, um, and um, there are not too many um, thinkers like him because I think, I think he takes architecture you know, as he said, he really values the ideas. So, you know, and architects are supposed to generate ideas. So when you have a client that loves ideas, that is something that's kind of invaluable, but also when, you know, in Philip's case, he can participate in the ideas. So, so I think it's been, you know, um, yeah, so it's, he's definitely unique, but I have a few other clients who are interested in new ways of doing architecture. Um, and I think they're, they're, they are in Detroit. And I think in many ways, you know, they all come to me with like projects that are real, that require serious thinking and kind of repositioning in terms of how to develop. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes it interesting. A lot of them are adaptive reuse, which is, you know, Detroit has a, you know, a large stock of like, unconventional buildings because it was like the manufacturing hub of America for a long time. Um, and so, so there's a lot of projects where they, you know, they basically come to me and they say, we've tried everything. We've, you know, worked with other architects. We can't figure this out. And I think that's what, and that's what makes it interesting for me too, because it's, it becomes a real challenge rather than, rather than, Oh, like we want your style mm -hmm. of architecture, you know? So I, and I think that's been, that's been the interesting thing. And that's also, in the way that I position my work with Philip uh, and in, and my work at large, I present it as a problem solving process uh, and idea generating process in response to the problems. Right. And therefore, when I and, I and I hope that when others see it, they you know they see it that way rather than oh that's that's a beautiful space or a cool space or mm -hmm. um, so I think that's that's helped me and I think yes yeah, so there's. I think we're shifting, you know, and in many ways, Philip deserves a lot of credit for this because he was open to that. But in many ways, like whether, you know, like, you know, we're, we're shifting people's minds and shifting people's kind of perception of how to do architecture and how to develop. And I think, you know, it's happening in baby steps, but I think that that's been very interesting to see. Yeah. But there's, I would say there's no one like Philip in this case in, in terms of like the amount of risk he's willing to take and amount of like, um, uh, you know, like optimism he has around design and architecture and the generosity of architecture. What was it that um, had you come to move, like relocate to Detroit? Was it primarily working with Philip <laughs> or was it the, the kind of opportunity in the city as a whole? Yeah, so this was a kind of tough, you know, I would say it was, you know, life-changing decision. Um, at the moment, it seemed tough, but now it seems obvious. Mm -hmm. But I was, you know, I was doing work in New York City. Um, I started uh, even, uh, I started, and this is also a realm where it's like the idea of developing becomes less interesting for me, but I developed three floors of a Chinatown loft building into a co-working space called Based In uh, with my friend Tomas. So we, you know, so I, I kind of dabbled at that, but I also realized that that wasn't for me after, after I did that. Um, but so I was doing work in New York, you know, and a little bit of development in that scale. Um, and then um, I had clients in New York. A lot of them were uh, renovation projects for apartments. And so that, so there was this possibility, which was about, you know, New York City, about renovating smaller, you know, smaller spaces. You can't really build anything new there anymore because everything's built up. And there's this other possibility, which was through Philip, which was, you know, I know that he's acquiring land and, you know, at that point we had already designed Tukoy, the first restaurant, and then had been very successful. He was already working with Edwin Chan on that housing project called True North. And I knew that if I came to New York and he also told me that there would be work. So that was the other possibility. So I had to, I, and I, and I felt like it would be difficult to do both from New York. Um, at least the way that I work, I really need to be emotionally and uh, I know, you know, invested in, you know, the work I do, um, intellectually invested. So I'm, and, you know, I got to came to the conclusion that I have to, I have to come here because that's the way to see the work through. But I also had to say the work in interesting, which was more about renovation was less interesting. And in it, it also, it's somewhat a little bit more superficial because there's, 
you know, because of the rules and regulations, there's very little you can do to renovate an apartment. Mm -hmm. It just becomes about reskinning the bathroom and kitchen. Um, whereas in Detroit, we could really rethink um, and reorganize space to work for Detroit and serve as, a, you know, and serve as a kind of like a asset for Detroit in a way that responds to the you know conditions here. I, I want to jump in and say that the thing that yeah, makes ish so interesting to me and i've collaborated with a few very talented architects but the thing that makes ish so unique is that he's extremely connected to reality but at the same time he's a dreamer so for ish I, I, excuse me if i'm speaking for you ish but the way that i saw it was ish has very big ideas but ish is also grounded in reality if you really want those ideas to come to life and you want to maintain a relationship with your client you kind of have to the closer you are to the work, the bigger the ideas can become because there's so many things to try to resolve as you're working. It, it's, it, you can't just, honestly, it, it doesn't necessarily work. That's why development is considered to be so hard. You hire an out-of-state architect and they just send a set of documents to a contract that they've met a couple of times, not understanding the local building, the building codes, not understanding, um, you know, the trades, not understanding the site conditions really. Uh, and you just send an idea, you just mail an idea through email in a set of drawings and expect it to get built. It's not reality. Um, I think that Ish and I both knew that we wanted to experiment. And it, like I said, a, go a good architect can get you into trouble because they have, they actually sell you a, a new idea, but a great architect is also knows how to get you out of that trouble if it doesn't work so well. So throughout projects, we've had to change the materials that we use because you know there's material shortages and we've had to change this or we or or we have you know rest his soul our contractor dies in the middle of a project you know and mm. so the way that we knew that we were going to build things totally changes and i think that since ish wanted to experiment and do big ideas and and he developed enough trust in me i or i i, tr I trust him enough to, to go with his ideas ish has the the, the level of integrity to say I need to be there to help him figure out how to get into any trouble I get him into, you, yeah. you know, <laughs> is that right? Yeah, I, yeah, I think, no, absolutely. But I also, yeah, absolutely. I think for me, the, arch the architecture, a lot of people say is, is architecture the drawings for, for the building or is architecture the building? This is a common kind of, you know, like, you know, question to me, the architecture is the building. It's not the drawings because there are so many, and I, I guess it, just observation, there's so many architects that are producing drawings that have never built anything. And I, that, that to me is the least effective way to be an architect. Mm -hmm. And so getting it built is paramount. And so whatever it takes to get it built is paramount. And I believe in that. And I learned that when I, when I, when I went to Turkey to do uh, construction administration, like if I wasn't there, that building would, would have been materially different and maybe would not have happened. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's not because the drawings weren't beautiful that were sent there, but it's because, you know, someone needs to figure out how to make those drawings a reality. And, and so, and then, and then it's not about the sophistication or complexity. It's often about, you know, like, the contractors I spoke to, you know, we had a facade system where they were, were, which required custom gaskets, like rubber gaskets. And they were like, we don't have custom rubber. We can't extrude custom rubber gaskets. We can't import them from Germany, you know? So, and so you have to redesign that, you know, the project. So I think, so I think, so that's something that is important. So I know that if, if I want it built, I have to be here. <laughs> yeah. And that's how I, that's how, that's, that's how invested I am in the work because um and 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 it's also uh, the relationships because as philip was saying we're making decisions on site with the contractor and i have to know the contractor i have to know what philip's thinking and vice versa to know if a decision is going to be uh is is going to you know is going to be a good decision and and if we can execute it you know within a budget great um i was i was going to ask about the change in climate in Detroit um, in terms of 
development, are you finding that the opportunities are becoming harder to come by now? Or how has how much has the, you know, how much has the has the kind of development opportunity climate changed in the last few years since you've been developing? And is it becoming more competitive? Are we going to see what we've seen in other Amer um, US cities where real estate kind of just becomes this crazy, fierce, competitive thing? How are you, how do you plan for the future uh, and to kind of navigate around that? Well, thankfully, I acquired enough real estate to give me a runway. I can develop, I have land to develop for the next 10 years um, in this one, one area. Uh, I, I think that it's, it's really interesting city because there's a lot more development happening. There isn't an evident mm -hmm. audience because Detroit is a city that's built for 2 million and still only has 700,000. But the population that left only went 15 minutes away outside of the suburbs. So, you know, you can repopulate the city. It's still a metro major area. You have five professional sports teams. You have a symphony hall. You have an opera. You have, uh, you have an international airport 15 minutes away. Detroit is ready to boom. But there's still this dogma in development that you have to buy an audience and the majority mm. of the city, the, in, or, or you de develop for an audience. You, th that's an investor. A developer builds something that creates the audience, in my opinion. So mm. I, I think that, you know, you still have this dogma where people are afraid to go into areas where nothing's happening. They have to be connected to the action and, and the land in those areas, I think is probably overvalued. Buildings are probably overvalued um, because construction costs is going up. Maybe it's not overvalued. I, I don't really know. To be honest, Ryan, I don't keep up with the macroeconomics of development at all. I drive around and I see some cranes in Detroit now, which is awesome. I see more developers doing things, which is great. Um, the only thing that makes sense to me is pay as little as you can for the position and invest as much as you can into the idea. That's the only thing that makes sense to me. You know, love it. Brilliant. And what's you, what do you have planned for the rest of uh, 2022? We are, um, we just finished an awesome project. I haven't even put it on my website yet. Um, that is designed with me. It's, it was in addition to an existing 1915 building. It was a building that was two stories and then one story next to it. And in between those two was an alley. So we built a second story on top of the existing story, ran a roof over the alley and closed it. And we, and then Ish designed a corporate headquarters for a tech company. Um, we just completed that. And then we, we are going to extend this was Ish's idea. We have a park that we built on one side of a street called Grand River that Ish was involved in, but we use a landscape architect named Julie Bargman. Ish had the idea to extend the park across the street and to bring that activity across Grand River. So I'm actually here in Virginia working on that right now. And then uh, we, I have the buildings that I want around that park as well, which I want to talk to Ish about. But Ish has designed another 25 units of housing for me. Um, Edwin Chan designed 24 units of housing. I want to build more housing, which to me is the mortar of a neighborhood. You know, mm -hmm. brick is a material, but it's the mortar that kind of keeps it together. So to me, we need to fill the neighborhood in with more mortar, which is the housing. And so that's what I'm going to be focused on um, for the rest of this year. Love it. Anish. Yeah, I mean, so um, as Silva was saying, we're we're working. We're in we're in the middle of kind of uh, designing um, twenty something units um, that's multifamily and single family structures. So it's and and this is ground up new construction. So it's very exciting um, and. Um, and yeah, I'm also doing more housing uh, with a couple of other clients. Um, so I think that, you know, yeah, it's just all very exciting. I'm very, I'm very grateful to be able to do this. And, and um, also, you know, in the sense of, you know, like we're in, we're in a position now where like each project takes on a different kind of identity and shape and, and response to different things. So it's very interesting to, to, to be able to execute that and, yeah, it's all very exciting. And then, yeah, and, and to, to, to the other point, I think that, 
you know, Detroit, believe it or not, has like 90,000 empty vacant properties that are just owned by the city. And there's thousands more owned by uh, private entities. So I don't think that there's, to me, there's so much work to be done that we're, you know, that we're just at the tip of the iceberg. So Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, so the more creativity there is, the more, like in in my position, I just welcome any sort of creativity, any sort of development. And I think we kind of need everybody to be, you know, as many people to participate in the process and also develop their own kind of, you know, you know, like it's as, as it has been for us, it's a learning experience, but develop their own kind of way of developing or doing architecture. Um, And I think that's, you know, it's kind of like a testing ground in that way. So I think that that's what makes it exciting too. Brilliant. Excellent. Ish, Philip, thank you so much for that uh, in-depth tour about the relationship and your development projects. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Thanks for your interest and time. Thank you for having us. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.